Hello and welcome to Electronic Health Records. We are starting chapter one today and if you want to follow along in your book, um, we're going to actually pick up with lecture on page four. Um, we're going to start um, in that little introductory section there with an overview of electronic health records. Most providers of healthcare in the United States are required to use electronic health records or EHRs. EHRs replace traditional paper medical records that have been used for centuries, making health information accessible to healthcare providers across the world with only a few keystrokes. This nearly instantaneous access to health information increases facility efficiency, improves patient outcomes, and results in a healthier population. Now, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 authorized CMS to award incentive payments to eligible professionals who demonstrated meaningful use of certified EHRs. The healthcare providers that participated in the EHR implementation in 2011 were eligible for the maximum financial incentives. Financial incentives for healthcare providers continued through 2014, but beginning January 1st, 2015, provider reimbursement was re reduced if EHRs were not used. Now, we talked about this briefly in um, law, I believe it was, the difference between an electronic health record and an electronic medical record. So we're going to pick up with that over on page five. So the term electronic medical record and electronic health record are often confused with one another. EMRs and EHRs are similar concepts, but different in both scope and relationship. The EMR, if you remember, belongs to a single healthcare provider or an organization, whereas the EHR integrates EMRs from multiple providers. In other words, EMRs are individual data sources that inform and populate collected patient information to form the global EHR system. An electronic medical record is an electronic version of patient files within a single organization, and it allows healthcare providers to place orders, document results, and store patient information for one facility, commonly called the Healthcare Delivery System, or the HCD. For example, Hope Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, might implement an EMR to replace its separate order entry, results reporting, and documentation computer systems. Implementing a complete EMR will replace the paper medical record and can be used by physicians, nurses, other clinicians, and clerical staff. All right, moving over to page six, we're gonna talk a little bit about the EHRs. The EHR contains patient health information gathered from the EMRs of multiple HCD organizations and is electronically stored and accessed. EHRs differ from EMRs because they contain subsets of patient information from each visit that a patient has experienced, possibly at many different healthcare delivery systems. EHRs are interactive and can share information among multiple healthcare providers. According to the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, or HIMSS, the EHR is a longitudinal electronic record of patient health information produced by encounters in one or more care settings. The EHR system automates and streamlines the clinician's workflow, and it has the ability to independently generate a complete record of a clinical patient encounter and possesses sufficient data granularity to support clinical decision support systems, quality management, clinical reporting, and interoperability. The term longitudinal indicates that a patient's EHR will continue to develop over the course of care. Every medical event and document can be accessed within the EHR, regardless of the facility, country, or time period. Kim Singh's longitudinal EHR is represented in Figure 1.3, and that's over on page 8, and now contains both her visit to Dr. Carruthers' office and her emergency department visit to Hope Hospital. Notice that patient information can be freely shared among different healthcare delivery settings. This patient's longitudinal EHR will continue to grow as she has additional encounters with providers such as optometrists, surgeons, outpatient surgery centers, nursing home, dentist offices, or other mental health professionals. All right, moving over to page eight, we're gonna pick up with interoperability. 
The success of an EHR primarily rests on interoperability, which is the ability of one computer system to communicate with another computer system. Similar to how individuals must speak the same language to share information and understand what is being communicated, computers must also speak the same language to communicate. Additionally, the systems must be able to operate at a high enough level of interoperability to share and process data. Now, we've got different levels of interoperability. There are six recognized levels, um, so we're going to kind of break those down. Now, within healthcare computer systems, there are three different levels of interoperability that demonstrate a range of communication ability. Computer systems unable to exchange information are considered level zero. Those are your standalone systems and there's, there's no interoperability there. Whereas computer systems with a level three interoperability can share and manipulate data to the degree needed to support the EHR systems. And you can look at um, figure 1.4 on page nine and then we also have this chart here in the slides. Um, so level one, there's infrastructure allowing for exchange of bits and bytes of data. This is called technical interoperability. It's considered the basic or foundational level of communication. This communication allows infrastructure or systems to exchange bits and bytes of data without any ability to interpret the data. Then we have level two. This is syntactic interoperability. This level provides a common data format for data exchange. The data can be interpreted but the meaning of the data may not be understood. Then we have level three. This is semantic interoperability. This is a high level of interoperability that allows the meaning of the data to be shared. The data and information may also be interpreted, which allows the EHR systems to function. And then on the slide, you see we have level four through six. The higher the level, the greater the amount of data manipulation and conceptualization occurs. So again, the focus for um, interoperability in the EHRs is going to be in relation to levels two and three. A minimally successful EHR system must at least use a common data format that can exchange information and that format must meet the definition of syntactic interoperability. However, ideally an EHR system will meet the definition of semantic interoperability, that's level three, so that health information can be understood and interpreted, not merely shared. All right, so let's drop down to computer protocols. Um, starting at the bottom of page nine. For EHRs to be useful and beneficial, all participating EMRs need one standard set of interoperability computer standards or pro protocols. A computer protocol is a standardized method of communicating or transmitting data between two computer systems. The most common healthcare communication protocol in use today is Health Level 7 International, HL7, which focuses on the exchange of clinical and administrative data. HL7 is also the name of an international group of collaborating healthcare subject matters experts and information scientists. All right, moving over to 12, we're going to continue talking about computer protocols. This is the challenge facing the health information technology stakeholders today, choosing one language or set of protocols that all EHRs will use thus enabling access for proper use of health information within the IT, health IT ecosystem. A health IT ecosystem, which you'll see in figure 1.6 at the bottom of page 10, is a collection of individuals and groups that are interested in health information technology. Included in a health IT ecosystem are clinicians, hospitals, various healthcare providers, public health workers, technology developers, payers, researchers, policy makers, individual patients, and many others. All of these stakeholders in the health IT ecosystem are interested in interoperability. Health information is accessed and shared for quality and safety and care delivery, population health management, regional information exchange, and analytics for research. Data can then be used to establish or update clinical guidelines to support public health policy 
and to update CDS systems. All right, moving over to page 11. The Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, ONC, is the federal U.S. federal body that recommends policies, procedures, protocols, and standards for interoperability. The ONC is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and was created by the ARA. The mission of the ONC is to improve health and health care for all Americans through use of information and technology. In its works to improve health and health care through the use of information and technology, the ONC has been working on interoperability with interested stakeholders of health IT. The ONC published a 10-year vision to achieve an interoperable health IT infrastructure that is to be accomplished by achieving following three goals. So, these three goals, um, which that's not it i'm looking kind of through these slides here um so our three goals was from 2015 to 2017 was to send receive find and use priority data domains to improve health quality and outcomes in 2018 to 2020 the goal is to expand data sources and users in the interoperable health it ecosystem to improve health and lower cost and then from 2021 to 2024 the goal is to achieve nationwide interoperability to enable a learning health system in which the patient is at the center of a system that can continuously improve care, public health, and science through a real-time data process. A learning health care system is an approach to improving the quality of health care by using patient clinical data from EHRs to drive medical research and by using medical research to influence clinical practices. An LHS has patients at the center of a system that continually collects and processes data, working toward goals of improved quality of care. The ONC has funded a number of health IT programs, including a development of the Nationwide Health Information Network. The Nationwide Health Information Network is a set of standards, services, and policies that enables health information to be securely exchanged over the internet and it will help create an environment in which health information is stored and shared securely and electronically. All right, we're gonna move on to federal regulations over on page 12. Members of the US Congress demonstrated their commitment to the nationwide implementation of EHR techno technology by enacting HITECH, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act in February of 2009, which was part of the ARA. This legislation set aside $19.2 billion to achieve the following goals. To encourage physicians, hospitals, and other providers to implement the EHR by offering financial incentives. The High Tech Act defined different stages of the EHR implementation and funding to healthcare providers. For example, physicians could receive up to $44,000 in incentive payments under Medicare, and even more if they treated Medicaid patients. A hospital could receive up to $2 million as a base payment. To create the Health Information Technology Extension Program, which was designed to help small and medium-sized physician practices implement an EHR system, and to establish a National Health Information Technology Research Center and regional extension centers to work with each other to share best practices for implementing EHRs and act as resources for physicians and other healthcare providers. Now, this slide doesn't depict all of the things that were funded by high tech. It really is only introducing the primary areas of policy that were funded to help expedite and promote EHR implementation in the U.S. So let's talk a little bit more about um, the incentive program, which we know is called Meaningful Use. We've mentioned this before in a couple of our classes. So we're going to see a little later on, you're going to see some more of these dollar amounts in a, in a separate slide. So I'm just going to kind of stick with these slides as we go through. So on the bottom of page 12, after a provider implemented an EHR system that met the established government requirements, that provider upon submission of an application would receive incentive funds under the Medicare and or Medicaid programs. Eligible healthcare providers that implemented meaningful use, 
of a certified EHR received up to 44,000 over five years under the Medicare EHR incentive program and up to $63,750 over six years under the Medicaid EHR incentive program. Providers who did not implement an EHR system by January 1st, 2015 have been receiving reduced reimbursement from Medicare. For example, physicians who had not adopted certified EHR systems or could not demonstrate meaningful use by the beginning of 2015 saw their Medicare reimbursement reduced by 1% a rate that was increased to 2% in 2016 and 3% in 2017. If less than 75% of eligible providers have become meaningful use users of EHRs by 2018, the, adjust the adjustment will change by one percentage point each year to a maximum of 5%. Obviously, most healthcare facilities desire full reimbursement and cannot afford to never implement an EHR system because in some cases, 2%, 3% of your Medicare dollars, that can mean the difference in having your doors open and your doors closed. Um, that's a lot of money, especially with um, facilities that have an older population. Medicare is gonna be the primary source of reimbursement. So this is a very big deal. All right, so we're gonna move on over to uh, page 13, we're going to continue talking about meaningful use and um, look at figure 1.7. Um, this is actually talking about the eligible providers and you have different eligible providers for Medicare and then for Medicaid. So Medicare are going to be more along the lines of your physicians. You have your doctors of medicine or osteopathy, doctors of dental surgery or dental medicine, doctors of podiatry, doctors of optometry, and then you have your chiropractors. Now, for the Medicaid incentive program, it kind of expands a little bit. It includes your nurse practitioners, your certified nurse midwives, and then your physician assistants who furnishes services in a federally qualified health center or a rural health clinic led by a physician assistant. So you, you, it expands a little wider for um, Medicaid. All right, so let's get to talking about meaningful use. There are three stages, and we're going to cover each one of those here. So, meaningful use um, is the set of standards defined by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that govern the use of the EHRs. Meaningful use is defined as using certified EHR technology to improve quality, safety, and efficiency, and reduce health disparities engage patients and family, improve care coordination and population and public health, maintain privacy and security of patient health information, and then ultimately it is hoped that meaningful use compliance will result in better clinical outcomes, improved population health outcomes, increased transparency and efficiency, empowered individuals, and more robust research on health systems. And so when we get into actual stage one, this was um, implemented during 2011 and 2012, and there were three main components of stage one. First one, the use of the certified EHR technology in a meaningful manner, such as electronic prescribing. Two, use of certified EHR technolo technology for the electronic exchange of health information to improve the quality of care. And three, use of certified EHR technology to submit clinical quality measures and other measures. Then we're moving on to stage two. It expanded upon stage one criteria and encouraged the use of health IT for continuous quality improvement at the point of care and the exchange of information. So there were seven topic areas of objectives and measures in stage two. These included protecting electronic protected health information, e-prescription, e-prescribing, health information exchange, patient-specific education, medication reconciliation, patient electronic access, and public health reporting. A few examples of meeting the criteria included in stage two include generating and transmitting electronic prescriptions upon the discharge of a patient, providing the patient the ability to view online 
download and transmit their health information within 36 hours of discharge, and having the hospital send a summary care record for each patient who transitions to another institution or provider for care. Now we're moving on um, into, um, which we don't have slides apparently for um, the other stages, so stage one and stage two. Um, so moving on to stage three. So stage three, continue to expand on stage one and two by requiring providers to meet criteria that demonstrate coordination of care through patient engagement and participation in the health information exchange and public health reporting. There are eight topics, topic areas of objectives and measures in stage three. These objectives and measures include the following, protect EPHI, the e-prescribing, CDSSs, computerized provider order entry, patient electronic access, coordination of care, health information exchange, and public health reporting. Now, examples of meeting the criteria included in stage three include implementing CDSSs, also um, our CPOE for medication, lab, and diagnostic imaging orders, and an important change to meaningful use in 2018 is that all providers will be required to participate in stage three, regardless of their prior participation in the meaningful use program. The government is moving all providers to the same stage of meaningful use to simplify reporting requirements and to have everyone focused on the same objectives and criteria. All right, so moving on to our benefits at the EHR. We have three main benefits, improved documentation, streamlined and rapid communication, and immediate and improved access to patient information. Now, that first paragraph in the top kind of summarizes all of that. The transition to EHRs require monumental effort on the part of doctors, healthcare staff, regulators, government officials, and everyone working in the healthcare industry. So implementing an EHR is a painful process. There's been a huge adjustment period for your providers because we're talking about physicians that have been documenting on paper for years and years and years. And so making this transition is a little bit difficult. Now, getting into these benefits, let's start with improved documentation. So the classic complaint, you've heard it from me, you've probably heard it from other, but doctor's handwriting is awful. Many medication errors are the result of illegible and misinterpreted physician notes. Staff members waste time and become frustrated trying to read and interpret clinician notes, and the clinician often needs to be contacted to clarify meaning. So you can look on the page um, 16 and see a handwritten progress note and see how terrible that is, if you can read any of it at all. I mean, it, it is very just, it's, it's very illegible. But if you look at page 17, you see an electronic progress note. So you have totally different scenarios, completely legible. All right, moving down to um, our second benefit, streamlined and rapid communication. The implementation of an EHR system streamlines, streamlines the patient documentation process. The provision of patient care in any healthcare delivery system is complex because of the coordination of staff members and workflow processes in such areas as medications, procedures, testing, decision making, and communication. When documenting patient care using a paper record, healthcare personnel must enter patient information multiple times on multiple forms. However, when documenting patient information electronically, personnel enter the information once, which saves time, allows an easy database search, and helps maintain the consistency and integrity of the patient record. EHR technology also allows for streamlined and rapid communication of information. For example, instead of waiting for a patient's test results to pass among several staff members, 
Healthcare providers using an EHR system can be automatically alerted when the laboratory technicians file the report. All right, moving over to 18 and our third benefit, immediate and improved access to patient information. With a robust interoperable EHR system, healthcare organizations can nearly instantaneously access a patient's health history by viewing a patient's dental records, home health care visits, psychiatry records, and any other necessary history. The significance of this ability cannot be overstated. Healthcare staff can spot medical errors and inconsistency more quickly and can instantly view the results of medical procedures performed across the globe. They can easily track and measure years of patient outcomes without having to search for misplaced records. Healthcare facilities are not the only ones benefiting from this access. Patients who can't remember past procedures, diagnoses, or allergies can be protected from hasty and under-informed under medical decisions. Patients can monitor personal health goals and even report glucose readings or progress during their exercise routines from home, and patients with an allergic reaction or injury presenting to a different hospital while on vacation will not have to worry. All of their health records will be accessible, thus allowing any healthcare provider the ability to make informed and safe choices. Now, so we talked about the benefits. Let's talk about the barriers to implementation because there are quite a few. To best assist with the transition to EHRs and to ensure an efficient, successful program, it's important to understand the reservations held by some patients, physicians, staff, and agencies. Many of these barriers are valid concerns in the emerging EHR field. So let's start with the first one, high cost. High cost is the most common barrier described by the healthcare leadership. Whether the cost is $15,000 to implement the EHR system for a small physician or dental practice or several million dollars for a large hospital, the cost can be a relative burden for most healthcare providers. Although federal financial incentives have helped offset the cost of implementing EHR systems, healthcare providers did not receive the incentive funds until after the systems were implemented and proven to meet the U.S. federal standards. For a small nursing home, a mental health center, or even a small hospital, the required large investment in adopting and implementing EHR technology, technology can be a significant deterrent. Our second barrier, insufficient privacy and security. One of the biggest benefits to an EHR system is easy access to patients' medical records, but it is also one of the public's biggest concerns. Unlimited access requires facilities and providers to install secure firewalls and to implement privacy policies and procedures, access monitoring, and privacy breach enforcement. Violations of online security involvement credit card companies, banks, and gaming systems have altered the public to the have alerted the public to the risk of storing and distributing personal information online. So the thought of such personal information being only a few clicks away can be troubling, possibly discouraging patients from being honest about their medical histories. Third barrier, inexperience in implementation and training. U.S. federal regulations requiring HCD systems to implement EHRs have spawned the growth of many EHR systems and vendors. Faced with the great variability of the products and service levels in the EHR market, physicians, dentists, hospital chief executive officers, and others are justifiably reluctant to select an EHR company that may leave its clients with little to no support. Such lack of software support could mean that the healthcare provider would have to implement an entirely new EHR system, resulting in increased cost and disruption of service. CEOs and office managers are also concerned about hiring the right staff to implement and maintain the EHR. Employers must ensure that new staff members will be qualified to handle the move away from paper records. The U.S. federal government recognized this issue and passed legislation to create certification programs for health information technology careers. And our fourth barrier, significant daily process changes. 
Doctors and staff may also be reluctant to embrace a system that requires an overhaul of their daily duties and tasks. A physician might argue that using EHRs will take longer to process patients and their information. For example, after a patient checkup, the physician might typically jot down notes or dictate into a tape recorder, then pass that information along to a staff member for transcription. With the EHR, the doctor must log on to the system, locate the patient's chart, enter the information, and then save it to the patient's files. All employees of a healthcare facility will experience similar changes to a system they might have been using for several years or decades. This change in routine could easily feel frustrating and unnecessary, thus creating barriers to change and difficulties in the, uh, in the successful implementation of an EHR system. It may take years for staff members to buy into new technology. Offices might also see staff turnover as a result of duty and task changes. And I can tell you in my experience, um, we actually had a physician office, um, Tupelo Medical Group, who decided that they no longer wanted to admit patients to the hospital in Tupelo. So when we implemented SCM, which is the, the electronic health record, uh, they no longer admitted patients to Tupelo. They didn't want to deal with learning an electronic medical record. So they just stopped sending their patients, or they didn't stop sending their patients to the hospital, but they stopped seeing their patients in the hospital. So they turned all of their patients over to the hospitalist group. All right, so moving on to page 20. Moving forward. In the same way that building a new subway system or highway is expensive to implement and may cause traffic delays while being built, investment in the EHR is a temporary burden. The savings from replacing inefficient paper medical records will inevitably pay off the initial investment and healthcare providers can switch to a more efficient system. But we do have some future challenges. Privacy and security problems are not specific to EHR. Rather, these problems are similar to those of any company or industry that maintains an online presence. Although efforts must and will be made to protect personal health records, the world is just beginning to understand the true risk of managing personal information online. Because of increasing awareness of identity theft, many people have learned not to post the names and birth dates of their children on personal websites, and others have learned not to email credit card and social security numbers based on unsolicited requests. In the same way, industries are using significant resources to create security programs and procedures to address past breaches and anticipate future issues. Dropping down to the bottom of page 20, as the field of HIT grows, more students will graduate with the appropriate knowledge and experience to implement, use, and maintain the EHR system. The inconveniences experienced by doctors and other clinical staff early on in the process are essential steps towards the dramatic improvement to the U.S. healthcare system. Now, let's talk about some evolving roles in um, the EHR environment. Managing the transition from paper to electronic records requires individuals with special skills and education. The U.S. Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the demand for health information management professionals will increase 15% from 2014 to 2024, much faster than the average for all occupations, and it acknowledges that the increasing use of electronic health records will continue to broaden and alter the job responsibilities of health information technicians. For example, with the use of EHRs, technicians must be familiar with the EHR computer software, maintaining EHR security, and analyzing electronic data to improve healthcare information. AHIMA provides many opportunities for credentialing health information professionals interested in implementing and managing EHRs such as the following. So we have our RHIT, which is our Registered Health Information Technician, which of course is um, what you will earn after you um, complete your associate's degree and sit and pass the exam. And then you have your Registered Health Information Administrator. This is after um, a bachelor's degree. And then we also have the CHTS, which is Certified Healthcare Technology Specialist. 
This certification denotes proficiency in certain health IT roles and is intended for professionals with various education backgrounds who are interested in working with EHRs. Certified in Healthcare Privacy and Security, or the CHPS, is a certification that identifies an individual's competence in privacy and security protection programs in all types of healthcare organizations. All right, and moving over to 22, we're going to talk a little bit about more about HIMSS, the Health Information and Management Systems Society. And they also offer um, some professional certifications. They offer the CH or CA HIMSS Certified Associate in Health Information or Healthcare Information and Management Systems. This is designed for IT professionals new to the health information arena. And then you have the CP HIMS, the Certified Professional in Healthcare Information and Management Systems. And it's a professional certification for those experienced healthcare information and management system professionals. In addition to the well-established certification programs, the U.S. federal government set aside $32 million in grants through the High Tech Act for universities to train individuals in an abbreviated, abbreviated health information management course. Individuals who trained under these programs were eligible to take the CHTS. Now this company exam, it specializes in practice workflow and information management redesign specialist, clinician practitioner consultant, implementation manager, implementation support specialist, technical software support staff, or a trainer. Employee positions at a healthcare delivery system Provider include Chief Information Officer, Systems Analyst, System Administrators, Database Administrators or Specialists, EHR Project Managers, and the EHR Trainer. These positions are explained in more detail in the student resources and are primarily available at either a healthcare provider or an EHR software vendor. Other health-related entities such as insurance companies, durable medical equipment companies, medical billing companies, and so forth, continue to create positions to work with EHRs for healthcare facility customers. Creating a national and international record-keeping system will not be simple, but this task is a testament to the scope and vision of the EHR implementation. Although the current generation may experience struggles as the EHR is implemented, the resulting nationwide EHR system will provide future healthcare providers with a more reliable, efficient, and cost-effective healthcare system. As healthcare and technology evolve together, new jobs and career opportunities will be created, patient outcomes will improve, and healthcare delivery will see gains in efficiency, communication, and overall quality. All right, so let's look at this chapter summary slide. The road toward universal EHR adoption will be a long one, but the benefits are worth the effort. EHR support reliability and efficiency in clinical, administrative, and operational processes. Exciting career opportunities for those interested in EHRs exist and will continue to exist. And professionals in various capacities related to EHRs make an important contribution to patient care. Now, be sure to read the chapter summary on page 23 and it goes over into 24 and you have a, an EHR review of all of the different acronyms and initials for um, several of the things that we talked about in this chapter so that's a good little review there as well. Um, you will complete the check your understanding quiz through Course Navigator and we'll get into that. Um, but if you have any questions about this chapter, feel free to email me or you can get with me um, during office hours. But I will continue to provide these lectures for each chapter so that you can listen if you are a learner that uh, learns more auditory in comparison to others. Um, so if you have any questions or any issues with this chapter, please um, feel free to contact me. Uh, again, be sure to read this entire chapter. I did not read every word in this chapter. Um, so go back through your chapter, make sure you understand the different levels of um, meaningful use, um, your barriers to implementation of EHRs, and the benefits of your um, EHR implementations. Good luck and have